Alright dude, you ready to film? I mean, yeah, I guess. I don't know, I feel really weird about today's episode. I'm not really sure if, if I want to... You know what? How's the shot look? Does the shot look good at least? Yeah, I, yeah, the shot looks great. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really dark in here. You know, that's kind of how I want it today. You know, I'm feeling a little dark. Uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, just uh, the sun hurts my eyes and everything. I'm, go I'm gonna open up the blinds. No, Greg, no, you don't. No, 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 no! Gerard, what are you? This is what I am, Greg. This is what I've become. Beautiful. Greg, this is the skin of a cold-blooded killer! I brought ice cream sandwiches. Did you guys start shooting yet? Where's the right shirt? Yes! Castlevania, Timpani of the Night. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Completionist. And here is week two of Super Beard Brothers Month. Just in case you missed last week, our second channel is going to be getting a huge overhaul this month. So to kind of honor that, we're going to be reviewing some of the games we've already completed on that channel. And next up on the docket is Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Do you think before we start we can maybe address the sparkles? No! Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Any one gamer who lived through the 90s will tell you that this sleeper hit is almost single-handedly responsible for reinvigorating the entire Castlevania franchise. It successfully broke the linear level-driven mold the series was known for and it introduced the fantastic RPG and Metroid-style open-world elements that would eventually help coin the phrase Metroidvania. But Beardman, what about all the other Castlevanias we haven't done yet? Don't they deserve their own videos? And why aren't you doing a game where you play as a Belmont? Where's the whip? Where's my... My whip! Who took my whip? A lot has already been said about those other games, Greg, especially Simon's Quest and Super Castlevania 4. So while I'll probably get around to them eventually, we're going to hear the much more interesting and emotionally compelling story of Alucard today. And call me crazy, Greg, but I'm pretty sure you've never actually owned a whip. He did briefly, but I hit it because he hurt me with it. Oh hey, it's Alex! I've just been here the whole time. Alucard is Dracula's estranged half-vampire, half-human son. His mother Lisa was murdered for her forbidden affair with the Dark Lord, but with her dying breath, she gave Alucard the power to choose between a life of good and a life of evil. Now, Dracula is returning, and Alucard has awakened from his eternal sleep. He's headed to his father's castle to destroy him. Yikes! How did Dracula and his mom even meet? It's not like they could run into each other at the grocery store or something. Does Dracula even leave the house? Maybe she was his cleaning lady. I'm overthinking this. Also in the castle is Maria Renard, a young vampire hunter who's come looking for her mentor, Richter Belmont, who went missing in the castle five years earlier. Hey, a Belmont? Maybe he's got my whip. Maybe. However, Richter seems to have been acting pretty evil lately, and something fishy is definitely going on. It's up to Alucard to put all the pieces together. Symphony of the Night puts a vampire in the hero's role and a hero in the vampire's role, and it does a wonderful job of tackling the rather complex question of whether or not fulfilling your destiny is always the best idea. It's refreshing to see so much depth from this type of game, and even though the actual writing itself isn't always great, it definitely changes the feel of the whole experience for the better. Symphony of the Night definitely still feels like a Castlevania game, 
but it switches up and refreshes so many aspects of the series that it's not crazy to consider it the most single important milestone in defining the future of the whole series. It was released relatively early in the console cycle, so it uses more familiar tools, like 2D sprites instead of 3D polygons. But the PS1's more powerful hardware allows for much more beautifully detailed art, with better and atmospheric use of color, from smooth character animations to excellent and immersive use of parallax scrolling in a lot of the backgrounds. Plus, the bosses are huge, and there's just enough extra cool stuff to remind you that this definitely is not the Super Nintendo. This is also the first game in the series featuring character design by Ayami Kojima. <gasps> the director of Metal Gear? No. Oh, sorry. Jumped the gun there. Carry on. She's known for her expert use of an art style called Bishonen. It translates literally to beautiful boy, and its pretty androgynous male characters serve as a cultural outlet for non-conventional male-female gender relations in Japan. Her work has since become synonymous with the series. This game also has an excellent and incredibly varied soundtrack by, I'm gonna butcher this, Michiru Yamane, who also did the music for the prequel Castlevania Bloodlines. It takes a very postmodern approach to the game's tone, and many of the tracks originally written for this game are now classics because of it. Oh yeah, except for freaking I Am The Wind! I Am The Wind is the famously terrible song that plays over the end credits of most versions of this game, and man does it hurt to hear. Yamane had no part in writing this song, and it's just horrible! It's a disaster! I can't believe they chose this as the reward you get for all of your hard work. It's like all those weird R&B covers at the end of 90s Disney movies. Congratulations for beating the game! Enjoy this painful reminder of everything terrible about music in the decade we're currently living in. Ladies and gentlemen, fake Kenny G! As a whole though, the game does a great job of nailing that gothic feel, and everything from the architecture to the enemy names is well researched and actively contributes to the game's near perfect production design. My favorite little bits are the many environmental secrets that come up. I loved how you could just sit and go on a ghost date, or go to the confessional and get stabbed, or even go to the bottom where a skeleton is doing some cool cliffhanger moves. Castlevania 2 II and 3 brought a lot of interesting ideas to the table about how to switch up the side-scrolling formula, but it wasn't until Symphony of the Night that any of them were particularly successful. It breaks from the traditional level-based formula and introduces a Metroid-style open world where you have to solve tricky puzzles and use the items you find while exploring to access new areas. Symphony of the Night takes it one step further, though, by having the enemies you encounter give you experience points. There's a whole RPG-style leveling system. You can actually grind in this game to get past enemies that are giving you trouble. Yeah! Plus, you don't have to save the aliens! Oh, come on, Greg, that was one time, and I went back and got them anyways. Oh, what, too soon? That was- HOLY CRAP, THAT WAS 71 EPISODES AGO! How long has my whip been missing? There's also an extremely difficult but totally rewarding spell system. It feels like it's straight out of a Capcom fighter, except you have to discover all the moves on your own. It's awesome. The theme of exploration in this game never lets up. Besides the spells, there's a bunch of items that you really just have to experiment with to figure out what they do. And some of the armor and weapons that you can find in Outfit Alucard with grant bonuses when equipped together. Even the combat requires a lot of trial and error, as most of the weapons act totally different from each other and have very bizarre and random effects. You can also fight the bosses in any order, which is sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it leaves the difficulty level feeling kind of erratic at times, but it's cool that every playthrough is different and all the fights themselves are clever. The specific weaknesses each of them have were probably pretty fun to spread rumors about on the playground back in 1997 before you could just look it up on the internet. How else would you ever know that Alucard's doppelganger was weak to the stopwatch? Damn you, WikiLeaks! Without the internet to tell you what everything does, this game can be pretty tough to master. But on the other hand, a fantastic, fair, challenging action game with 25 to 30 hours of content is pretty tough to find nowadays. More power to ya, Konami. And don't forget about all the familiars. They're like Pokemon, but there's way less of them and they're a lot scarier. Each one has its own specific use, like the giant sword that follows you around, helping you kill stuff, or the fairy who throws potions at you when you're hurt and finds secrets. And they level up and get stronger too. 
just like Pokemon, right, Alex? Not really. Yep, just like Pokemon. After finally working your way through the whole castle, you reach Richter Belmont. And he's not looking so good. He's acting crazy and talking about how he wants to resurrect Dracula so they can fight forever. He attacks you, and if you want, you can end it right here, right now. That's it? Elocard stops Dracula, decides humans are the worst, and then just leaves? What a horrible game! Burn it! Or no, whip it! Whip it! Hold on, Greg. I did say, if you want. You mean there's more? You betcha. Alex? Right. As you make your way through the castle, you may encounter and defeat a succubus. Besides learning some cool stuff about Alucard's past, killing it will earn you a gold ring. Then you can find the spike breaker armor in the catacombs and use it to get you through the spiky hall in the chapel, earning you the silver ring. Take the rings to the clock room, equip them, and they will reveal a secret room that leads you to Maria, who gives you the holy glasses. Phew. Did everybody get all that? Who knows, man? But hey, if they didn't, they can always use WikiLeaks, right? I'm not sure you know what WikiLeaks is. If you wear the holy glasses during the Richter fight, a ball of demonic energy will be revealed, and it seems to be controlling Richter. Destroy it, and the evil priest Shaft appears. Shaft? Sorry, the evil priest Shaft? Who's the black private dick that's a sex machine to all the chicks? Damn right. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, Greg, what's so funny? The man's name is Shaft. I can think of at least three ways why that is a weird name for a priest. <sighs> Whatever. Next, you're treated to a cutscene where you see another upside down castle appear out of the sky. That's right. You know the castle you've been in the entire game? A whole other one just appeared, full of new enemies, new bosses, new items. It's time to fight new bosses, collect Dracula's body parts, and then hours later, it's finally time to settle things with your father. In the final battle, human emotion takes on cold evil. Alucard forgives humanity for their faults, just like his mother did, and with this knowledge, Dracula is defeated by the power of true love. Alucard disappears forever, and Maria, touched by his new humanity, follows. Whoa! That's exactly how Harry Potter beat Voldemort! What if J.K. Rowling's a huge Castlevania fan? <gasps> they came out the same year! Probably not, Greg. I bet Richter is a Hufflepuff. Maybe he's a Jigglypuff? There's not a whole lot to do in this game for the challenge-hungry completionists out there. Sure, there's a lot of castle to explore, but all the bonuses in the game just require you to beat it with a certain percentage of the map uncovered, so it doesn't really matter what you do and don't do while you explore. Symphony of the Night has two endings for killing Richter. One with and one without the Holy Glasses, and two for killing Dracula. One for exploring under 196% of the castle, and one for going over. Completing the game in any way with over 180% completion also earns you access to a sound test in the library next time you start a file. Completing the game once and starting a new file also grants you access to some special bonuses, depending on what you name your character. Naming him Axe Armor grants you the armor of the Axe Lord enemy. Naming him XVQ grants you 99 luck. And finally, naming him Richter lets you play through the game as Richter. Where yes, Greg, your only weapon is a whip. Yes! Finally! Greg has his day! Richter Belmont's the coolest! Everyone's getting whipped! Ghost ride the whip! Ghost ride the whip! Ghost ride the whip! Ghost ride the whip! Beating the game with Richter also has its own ending, but boy does it ever stink. He sort of just stands there and watches the castle get sucked up. Lame. I wouldn't say that Symphony of the Night is a particularly challenging game. Sure, it requires a bit of patience sometimes, like with all the stupid Medusa heads, but it's still very accessible, and even though it's almost 20 years old, it hasn't really lost any of its magic. It's like the Jurassic Park of video games. Those dinosaurs still look real, man! In this game, completion equals grinding and exploration, so you just get more and more powerful the more you fill the map. 
especially once you find the Chrysogrim, a rare weapon drop in the inverted castle, which you get from killing the enemy called Shmoo. It literally breaks the game, it's so powerful. If you want any sort of challenge from this game at all, avoid it at all costs. That said, it's still easy to get overwhelmed by enemies sometimes, and having to go into the menu to equip healing items forces you to use the Fairy Familiar for most of the game, or else you'll face very, very tedious menus whenever you want to heal. Still, these are minor things that in the face of how great this game truly is, it's never repetitive, it's surprising, and so in Symphony of the Night's case, the struggle wasn't really a struggle after all. Castlevania Symphony of the Night is one of the best games on the original Sony PlayStation. It has a timeless look and feel, the gameplay is a complete joy, and the themes it attempts to tackle are incredibly impressive. I can't believe it took me this long to finally play it, and even after totally completing it, I'm sure that I've played a few more times in my life. It's just that damn good. With that in mind guys, this game gets my completionist rating of Complete It. Which Timpany it of the night. Well, that's all the time we have for today, guys. So as always, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Hey, uh, let's talk about those sparkles now. I think it's something that needs to come up. I won't talk about the sparkles. But I will dance them. I will dance them. Mm -hmm.